and that will be Ruben, who will be speaking about stream processing with Rico. Rico. <laughs> okay, so first off, uh, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, currently, I'm the managing director of Energy Development. Uh, it's a software development firm focused on uh, back end systems uh, and data analysis. I've been programming in Python uh, since about 2011, uh, so around six years so far. Uh, I'm the author of several popular packages, uh, one of which I'll mention in this talk today, which is Rico. Another one is called Meza, which is a data analysis library, and I'll be giving a workshop on that tomorrow. A uh, third one is called PyGoGo. Uh, it's a login library, uh, and it's used under the hood in the two previous libraries. And also, just to give you an idea of some of my preferences, I um, prefer Flask over to Django, um, Twisted over Tornado, and Functions over Classes. Okay, so streams. Um, essentially, a stream is, you can think of it as a sequence of data or a sequence of pieces of information. Uh, so if you look on the left-hand side, just imagine those two circles as being, you know, think of it maybe as an integer. Um, each arrow represents a transformation or a function that you apply to that piece of information. And as you move left to right, you apply different functions um, to the pieces of data until you get something completely different at the end. And just to give you a, a visualization, um, so at the top, um, it's a, you can think of it as a stream of three integers, and then the bottom are three different transformations. So the first um, step is just multiplying by two. The second one is filtering for anything greater than two. And then the, the last step is, is an aggregation. So it's just creating a sum. So as you move along, um, you get the first item, um, which is one, you multiply it by two, and then you get two. Um, you go to the next step. The filter looks to see if it's greater than two. It's not, so it goes away. And then you multiply the next item by two and you get four. You go down again, uh, and the filter looks to see if it's greater than zero or greater than two. It is, so it stays. And then the next item gets multiplied by two, and then you get six. You go again, uh, so you're summing for the first time, and so it just stays four. The six is greater than two, so it stays. Um, for the next step, so now you add six to the result, and you get ten, and then your final output is ten. Um, so that's just to give you a really basic example of, of a stream process. Um, if you're doing complex stream processing, then you can work with anything. It doesn't have to necessarily um, be integers. Uh, and we'll get to that in a little bit later. Um, so next I'm gonna show you how you actually construct streams um, by using Python. Um, so first this is just looking at a stream. So in Python, um, a stream uh, is anything that is iterable. And so a string um, by itself is iterable. So if you just look at the first value, um, you get the letter A. Um, now we're going to actually take a, a phrase. Um, we're going to split it by spaces and then get the first item, which is here, hello. Uh, next, we're going to just create a list of numbers 1 through 10. And then getting the first item here, we see it's 1. Here, we're just going to use some, uh, this comprehension. Uh, and when you get the first item, um, you just get a dictionary with the key of x and the value of zero. Uh, and this third form is what we're actually going to be using um, going forward. So each stream is going to be represented um, by iterable dictionaries. Uh, and this is uh, similar, so instead of using a list comprehension, we're doing a generator comprehension. Um, who, who here is familiar with generator comprehensions? Just by the idea. Okay, cool. So a little over half. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, um, this essentially helps you save memory. Um, so instead of realizing the entire list at once, um, you just get back a generator object. And what you have to do is call next on the generator object. And when you call next, then it gives you the next value that's in the stream. And this is really useful when you're working with larger data sets that don't necessarily fit into memory. Okay, so now we know a little bit about streams. Uh, I'm going to show you a few things you can do to process those streams. Uh, so now back to the, the list comprehension. Um, here we're just going to use a function ORD. 
Uh, and all that does is it takes a string and it converts it into an integer. And so when we do that, um, you know, we have the, the word abracadabra, and then we get back a list of integers. Again, here's something simple. We're just multiplying everything times two. So you have a list of one through 10, and then you get back two through 20. Um, this is similar to the filter step that, that you saw in the visual. Um, so this is just looking for any integer greater than five, and then we get back to the list six through 10. And now this is going back to the generator comprehension that I, that I showed you earlier. So now we're representing the stream um, as a, a lazy list, uh, like a lazy list of dictionaries. And then in that second step, what we're doing is we're looking at the, uh, the, the number key and we're just summing all the numbers within that list. And then you can see here we get back 10. So it's adding zero plus one plus two, sorry, we get back six. So zero plus one plus two plus three um, is what gets you six. So okay, you know, who knows stream processing, what stream processing is, um, but you know, so what, why does it matter? Uh, so what I'm gonna do now is show you an example from several websites um, which use stream processing under the hood um, and which you may not know about. Um, so who here has heard of Feedly or has used Feedly before? Okay. So what Feedly is is a website um, that allows you to take articles or it could be a blog post, it could be articles from CNN, BBC. Um, most of these websites expose what's called an RSS feed. Um, Feedly is an RSS feed reader, so it's a website where you give it links of various RSS feeds and it aggregates all the articles in those feeds and then presents it to you in a nice pre-format like this. Uh, and so essentially, under the hood, what they're doing is they're using stream processing to aggregate the stream of articles from each feed, um, extract the image, extract uh, the content, uh, the author, the title, and then present everything in a you know, pleasant format. This next example is uh, Kayak. Uh, so I actually use Kayak um, when I got my ticket to come here. So Kayak is uh, an aggregator, and so what it does is it looks at prices for um, flights, um, hotels, uh, you know, car rentals, uh, and it gathers all of those prices. Um, and when you give it queries, it filters through its database to find the um, either the flights or cars or whatever you're looking for that meet your requirements. Uh, and you know, since it's taking data from various sources, they aren't necessarily in the same format. And so along the way, they're using stream processing to help normalize their data so they can get everything and present it to you um, in the way that you expect. And then this last example is what I call a mashup. Um, so this is, I was looking for a website that did some kind of mashup with Twitter, and I found this one called um, Portraiture. So what you do is you give it um, your username, so I'm, I'm Rubano on Twitter. Um, it looks at the uh, tweets that you um, tweeted you know, over a period of time, it then takes those tweets, um, extracts some um, keywords, and then uses the Flickr API to fl find interesting pictures that correspond to the topics you tweeted about. Um, so, you know, it says I tweet about um, Nairobi workshop, um, Kenya, and so you can see, you know, these are the images that it thinks um, correlate to, to those talks that I've tweeted about. Okay, uh, so next we're going to look at a few different frameworks. Um, so if you've done any stream processing, um, you may have heard of some of these. Um, so these are uh, Flink, Hugin, Hadoop, Storm, and Spark. Uh, and People use these frameworks to do different types of stream processing. Um, I'm going to take a look at two of the frameworks uh, before then um, telling you a little bit about Rico. Uh, so first, this is just uh, giving you an, an example of the data that we're going to be using with uh, with two of the frameworks. So it's just a simple text file. Um, I just went to Google and searched for Lorem Ipsum, and the first link that came up, I just I just copied the text. Um, so if you have this text file, um, you know, save. Uh, on your file system, and you, you know, have a goal to figure out what words are used in the file and how often. So first, I'm just going to show an example using the do. Okay, so I'm going to go through this quickly, I'm not going into too much detail, um, but there, there's a few important things to look at. So one um, is the Mr. Job that you're importing. So every class that you create um, just has a subclass Mr. Job. Um, and then within each class, 
you have to at least define a mapper um, and reducer. And the combiner is used just uh, to help optimize things. Because what Hadoop does is it parallelizes your task across different machines. And the combiner is basically like a mini reducer um, that operates on the parallelized machines before sending it to the final uh, reducing step. Uh, and then what you return within your, uh, within your, your method steps is this a Mr. Step. Um, and as, in this example, we only have one step, um, but you can have map reduce that requires several steps. And since it's in a list, you just basically have a comma and you can list as many Mr. Steps as you want. And so this is further down um, in the file. So the, the mapper, reducer, and combiner that I mentioned before, you define them um, as methods. And so here you can see um, they're just using regex uh, to look at each line, find each word, um, convert it to lowercase. And then in this case, the combiner and the reducer are the same thing. So what it's doing is taking um, each time the mapper um, yields a result, it gives one. And so in the reducer, you're summing all the ones according to the word. And so what you're able to do is you're able to see how many times each word was used. Um, one thing I didn't like about Hadoop is you actually can't run it interactively within Python. Um, that thing at the bottom is what happens when you run it in the command line. And so you actually have to take this file, run it in the command line, and then give an option of the file, of the input file. Uh, and so that's a little bit annoying. And you can see, you know, kind of verbose. Uh, so this next example I'm going to show you is Spark. And here you can already see it's a lot less code. Um, you're able to do um, pretty much the exact same thing. Um, the nice thing about this is that you can do everything within Python, so you can do it interactively um, within the IPython shell. Uh, and you can see here, so I'm uh, defining the file. So it's reading from HDFS, so you just give it the path to the file, um, and it's doing the same thing. It's um, looking at each line, splitting it by a space, um, to find the words for each word is converting it to lowercase and then yield to one. And then for each key, you sum up how many times um, one was there. Uh, and one of the things to uh, kind of notice is the first step is a flat map. And that's basically because you wind up having a nested list. And so when you do a flat map, it unnests the list for you. Um, but it does the same thing that the Hadoop version did. Uh, and you know, and fewer lines of code. And so when you call collect, what you wind up getting back um, is a list. Uh, and then in this case, um, you get call the first element of the list, and you can see, actually, um, slide type, I don't think the list is gonna be in a dictionary, um, but actually I don't run Spark on my computer, so I actually don't know how, what form it's gonna be. I think it just might be a tuple. Um, but it's, it's the same idea, you get back the first word, and then how many times it was, it was there. Okay, so next I'm gonna introduce um, Rico. So what Rico is, it's a stream processing library, um, and it's in pure Python. Uh, and essentially, I wanted to have an API that was similar um, to the way Spark allows you to do things. Um, the way it actually came, uh, came about is there was a project that I was working on that uh, required using Yahoo Pipes. How many people have heard of Yahoo Pipes? Okay, so Yahoo Pipes uh, was discontinued by Yahoo. Uh, and actually, at the time, I kind of saw the writing on the wall because the last entry in the Yahoo Pipes blog post was maybe four or five years old. Um, so I was looking for a way to do what Yahoo Pipes did. And what it did, for those who don't know, is allowed, allowed you to fetch RSS feeds from the web um, and then do transformations on those feeds um, and then output a new feed. So I was looking for a, a Python library that did the same thing. Uh, and I found one called Pipes Pi. Um, I wound up um, kind of optimizing that library and rewriting a lot of it. Um, and then it got to the point where my edits diverged so much that I just created um, a, a new library. Uh, and so this is essentially, if you're familiar with Yahoo Pipes, some of this will make a lot more sense. Uh, so as I said before, you're able to uh, fetch feeds from across the web. And in this case, you can take um, CSV, RSS, um, JSON, and HTML, and the output is, is the Python structure. Um, and in this case, it's an iterable, it's an iterable dictionary, um, you know, similar to what you see there. 
Okay, so first, um, just to get into the basic usage. So it's available via PIP, so this PIP install repo. And now I'm gonna do the same example um, with parsing that file, uh, this time using repo. Uh, so what you do is you import uh, what's called sync pipe. Uh, and sync pipe is what allows you to do the method chain that you saw in the part example. Um, there's gonna be a few parameters that you set. Um, so first is the URL to the file. Um, configuration, when we do the splitting, we just wanna split by spaces. And then the rule is gonna be for the transformation that we're doing. Uh, so you can see here, when, when you pass, uh, what you pass the sync pipe is uh, a string of the type of data that it is. So since it's a text file, we're just using fetch text. The configuration is gonna be the URL to the file. Uh, we're gonna do string tokenizer, um, which is what allows us to tokenize each line um, by the space. And then you can see where that emit equals true. That's similar to how PySpark did the flat map. So when we do emit equals true, it just um, takes what would be a nested list and flattens it into um, to a plain list. Uh, we transform it by lowercase, and then we're gonna count um, by the stream, stream transform. And that just is because when you do the transformation step, it outputs the result into a new key um, called um, stream transform. Uh, so in this case, what you get back um, is a generator. And so when you call next on it, then you get the dictionary. Um, so similar, you get the same result whether you do the Hadoop, Hadoop um, Spark or Spark. You call next again, and then you get the next, the next word. Okay, so now we're gonna do uh, another example using um, data that we can actually get from the web. Uh, so in this case, we're gonna use some data from Code for South Africa. Is anybody here um, representing Code for South Africa? Just curious, no? Okay, uh, so Code for South Africa, uh, they have a, a site of open data, um, which is data about South Africa. Uh, so once you go to the website, um, there's an option there to enter the data. So you click that and you get a list of the catalog. And so what I did is I just sort, uh, sorted it by most access. Uh, and then the first one there was statistics, uh, crime statistics from the police. And so we're gonna be using data uh, similar to this. So I'm not actually gonna use the whole data set, it's just a filtered data set. Um, and just because of making web requests, just to keep the, the latency down. And so here, it gives you a nice way to export the, a, the data. So there's actually an API endpoint, um, which outputs JSON. And so for these examples, we're, we're gonna be using this URL. Um, so what you'll see is if you, you're gonna pass the URL, and this is gonna be um, a path to a, a JSON file. Okay, so in this case, we're not gonna be, be doing any chaining. And so we're just gonna input the, the fetch data module directly. Uh, so it's, as before, you have a URL that you pass into the configuration, uh, and then when you call the pipe function, you get back a string. I'm oh, sorry, you get, you get back a string. Uh, so when you call next on the string, then this is the first um, data item that's there. So in this uh, data set, you can see that essentially what they have is they classify all the crime um, that happened within South Africa, and then they attribute to a police station uh, the number of incidents year in the province. And then if you call next again, then you just get the next item. Okay, so now we're gonna show a couple different things we can do. Uh, first, I'll just show you how you can filter and truncate. Uh, and here, again, we're gonna, since we're gonna be doing method chain, uh, we're importing this, this same pipe class. Uh, so first, what you want to do is you have your filter configuration. Uh, and here, we just want to filter where the province is the GP. Um, and then we're going to sort it, and we want to sort it by the number of incidents. And so here it is. So as before, you have sync pipe. Um, it's fetch data, um, which is a module that handles JSON. Uh, the configuration with the URL. Um, there's a dot filter, you can pass the filter configuration, sorting configuration. Uh, and then for truncating, you just want the top five. And so what you get back is the stream. And you can see here, uh, so this is uh, all theft not mentioned elsewhere. Um, over 3,000 incidents. 
and then you call next again, and you can see the number of incidents is slightly lower. So you know you can assume that it worked the way that, that I said it did. Okay, so the next example, I'm just going to do a, a simple join, and you can think of this as a join that you would have if this was a, a SQL table. So here we're going to be just importing fetch data and, and the join modules. The, the data that we're going to be joining here is URL2. Um, and it's also crime data, but it's another crime data set. Uh, and I'll just kind of show you what this data looks like so you haven't seen it yet. So what this has, uh, it has each station, each police station, and then the total of crime incidents um, for the 2014-2015 um, year. And so now what we want to do, since we're joining, um, we have a join configuration. And so in the first data set, the key is police station. And the second data set, the key is station. So here we're just saying that we want to take those two data sets and any time those two keys match, then you know, merge that data set together. So then the result that you get, you can see here, this was the original data that was in the first stream. And then that's the additional data from the second stream that's been merged together um, into one dictionary. And this is just showing you the next item um, for the same thing. And so what I showed you just um, so far was uh, one basic usage of it. Um, so Rico actually has a few different APIs. Um, so that was the synchronous API. Uh, it also has an asynchronous API and a parallel API. And so I'll give you an example of using the, the async API. So under the hood, it uses Twisted. Um, but as you'll notice, um, the, the imports uh, aren't going to be exactly the same um, because Twisted uses this, Twisted was before Pep8, and they use Camel Face. So I actually have a small wrapper um, that uses the more conventional Pep8 um, lowercase. And so you just pip install repo, a, repo async. And then New things you get you see at the top are the code routine, um, React, and then there's going to be the async collection. Um, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to give it two URLs, um, and we want to collect data from both streams um, at the same time. And so you just pass a collection, your sources, and a list. And there's a code routine decorator. And so when you actually uh, run this in the reactor, then you get um, the result of the next item in the stream. And so this was just like the very first example that I showed you. Um, it's just a dictionary with, with all the police assistance. Uh, next, I'll show you how you do something similar using the parallel API. So you can use um, multiple threads and also use multiple processes. Um, and so this one, I'll just show you how you do it with multiple threads. And so in this case, um, instead of an async collection, we just have a sync collection. Uh, and it's similar as before, so the same sources, uh, just a list of URLs. You pass parallel equals true. And then you can see the first item of the stream um, is what we had before. And then here, this is looking at the last item in the stream. And so this is the second data set. And so you can essentially pass it a list uh, of as many URLs as you want. Um, and you're able to fetch data from all of those in parallel. And then there's processes. So when you want to use processes instead of threads, you just pass the argument threads equals false. Uh, and then when you do that, you are using multiple processes instead of threads. So if you have some fetching that involves uh, using the CPU uh, instead of input-output, then you would use this method. Okay, so now I just kind of want to show you the differences between um, Rico and some of the other stream processing libraries that you may have heard of. Um, so first, just using looking at installation. If you ever have used Spark or Storm or any of those other ones, the installation method is quite complex. You usually have to install Java. Um, you sometimes have to run a cluster. Uh, you can see in the Hadoop case, you can't even run it within Python. You need to use the command line. Um, Hugin is a Ruby library, um, and it's similar to if this, then that. 
um, but it does some stream processing. Um, it's a little easier to install, but it actually requires a database. Uh, and so compared to repo, which is pure Python, um, and it's you know the easiest of all of them. The main difference uh, between repo is that repo is pool based. So as I was showing you before, in, the, in those examples, you call next on the stream. And so what that means is that you have to ask for the next item of, uh, of the stream, whereas with Spark and Fusion, they're push-based. And so what that means is with those libraries, you're actually, you're actually able to um, react to changes in the data as it happens. So for example, with Fusion, you can um, connect it to Twitter, and you can say if the number of times um, a certain item is mentioned, surpasses the threshold and send me an email. Um, whereas with Vigo, um, it doesn't have a push-based API, and so you're not really able to react to events as they happen. Um, another difference is the investors with um, Spark and the others, they're usually just focused on um, text and JSON. Uh, once you go to Hugum, um, it, all, it adds uh, RSS, uh, and then when you're looking at Vigo, um, it has even more gestures. So um, it's able to, to parse HTML and XML as well. Uh, and then looking at in parallel, all of them, um, you're able to run in parallel mode. Um, but as far as async, um, from what I've looked at, um, at least reading the websites and documentation, um, neither Spark or Storm or Hugin um, have an async API. And then finally, distributed. Um, Rico is meant to run on a single machine um, without a cluster, whereas Spark, Storms, etc., are designed for being distributed and running on multiple, multiple machines. Okay, so that's it. Uh, and I guess we'll open the floor for a question now. Okay, any questions? I can now repeat it for you. So, so he was asking um, if you can use repo to run it continuously. Um, so if you have a stream, um, just run it again and again. Um, and, and the answer is yes. And so actually there, there is a, an application that I built on top of repo which does that exact thing. Um, so I used, uh, I just had a twisted server and I just ran it on the loop. And so it just had the, I, I had the URL set and it ran the stream you know, every X number of minutes. And if there were new items in the stream, then it would just persist those new items um, in the Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Any further questions? So I noticed you uh, use quite a lot of text for configuration of your, your calls in Rico. Is there a more fluent interface available? Is that also something worth in development or under consideration? Yeah, so it's, it's something I'll take under, under consideration. Um, I can kind of tell you how that came about. So uh, this originates from the, the library which was meant to, to duplicate the Yahoo Pipes uh, way of working. And with Yahoo Pipes, um, essentially it stores all the configuration in JSON. And so repo is actually um, meant to work in a similar way. Uh, and in comparison to Spark, I don't know if you know this, but it, um, in the mappers and in the reducers, you pass pure Python. In repo, you pass text. And so I look at it as a feature, not a bug, in the sense that you can have a service that accepts a JSON configuration, and you can pass repo um, just essentially pure text. So that way you don't have to worry about you know passing Python structures um, back and forth. Um. and uh, 
some, you know, there are certain use cases where we want to get events that are full. Um, so I mean, that's a use case that, if I'm understanding correctly, Rico does require to get. So are you planning to extend Rico to get well, to, to full that use case? Or yeah, so, so the, the question was going back to the, the chart I had showed before, um, which was just a push versus pull. So since Rico is pull based, you can't currently respond to events as they happen. Uh, and yes, I would like to have that feature. Um, for me, the question is the best way to do it. Um, and I haven't really seen a best practice for using um, the stream you know, paradigm to implement uh, a push version. Um, and so I've, I've looked, I, I know um, Dave usually gave a talk about proteins, um, and he, there, there's a way that, that you could do the proteins, but in that, in the method he showed, it had like its own version of callback hell. Um, uh, so another thing is being pushed, you can, um, have a stream be sent to multiple um, sources, whereas in pool base, um, you can only have one consumer. And so that's also another disadvantage. Um, but I guess to answer your question, um, when I find like the you know, cannibal way to implement push um, in Python, then I would like to go down that road. Uh, we have time for one more question. So the question is about performance. Um, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I don't run Spark or Storm or even on my, on my computer. I don't wish to deal with Java. Um, but if there is anyone who has used those um, uh, and has a, a nice benchmark that you know that they could send me that I did that I can use some measure it, then you know I'd, I'd be happy to take a look. Uh, one of some of the things that I've tried to do is make everything lazy by the fault, um, just so that it doesn't use that much memory, but as far as speed, I, I, I have no idea. Okay, let's thank our speaker.